Fallout 76 came out last week, and it's rubbish. It's rubbish. Now, me saying it's rubbish has been upsetting people these past few days. Some people really love the game, and they're angry at me for saying it's rubbish. Some people really dislike the game, and they're just angry because it's me saying that it's rubbish. Because welcome to the internet. But regardless, whatever you think, do remember it's been scientifically, objectively proven by scientists in a lab somewhere that Fallout 76 is actual dog shit. And that's not me saying it, that's science. Anyway, with Fallout 76 coming out and being crap, I thought it'd be a good time to look back at Bethesda's history, a company that has made critically acclaimed games that deserved high praise, but were nonetheless made by a company that's prone to gross incompetence. So let's look back at some of the most massively incompetent things Bethesda's ever done. For shits and giggles. These days, Bethesda does a much better job on the porting front, with the constantly re-released Skyrim giving the studio more than ample practice. This was not always the case, however. Last generation, the company's console ports were utterly wahoful, embarrassingly broken endeavours that could very well have been cause for a product recall, given how completely rubbish they were. The PlayStation 3 suffered worst of all, with a litany of issues across Elder Scrolls and Fallout releases that were, at times, beyond fucking belief. One such example was Skyrim's memory overflow bug, where the simple act of saving the game exponentially increased the file size, creating more and more problems as it got bigger. Frame rate drops, low quality rendering, broken environmental interactions. It seemed that once save files surpassed 5 megabytes of space on the PS3 hard drive, anything that could go wrong had a chance to go wrong spectacularly. At its worst, quests would become impossible to complete, and the only way to rescue the game would be to restart the PS3 a temporary fix, as the game would start slowing down and breaking again after a few hours. Fallout 3 was a mess on PS3 as well. It would pause when console notifications appeared, frequently froze up, and of course the usual problems of slowdown and texture failure were abundant. It's not like the game was really fixed when it came back out as the Game of the Year edition, which also released to the PS3 as a buggy broken shit heap. These were just some of the issues with Bethesda on console. Fallout New Vegas was, despite being as buggy as any Bethesda game, a damn good Fallout, and quite easily the best of the modern era Fallout titles. This is thanks in no small part to Obsidian, whose prior experience with the universe allowed them to write a more authentic story than Bethesda had with Fallout 3, one that provided memorably unique characters, added a ton to the world's lore, and weaved a nice dose of humour into proceedings. Considering Bethesda only gave Obsidian 18 months to do it all in, it's nothing short of miraculous that the game came out as good as it did. Yes, Bethesda's incompetence in this regard was giving New Vegas' developers only a year and a half to cobble the whole thing together. When the game came under fire for wholesale asset reuse, it seemed a bit unfair to throw that at Obsidian's feet given the time frame they had to work within. At a time where crunch periods are being quite rightly criticised as unfair to employees and unhealthy to boot, it's especially hard to consider exactly what kind of workload was put on this team's shoulders. As well as new weapons and gameplay systems, New Vegas included branching story paths and over 65,000 lines of dialogue. Not only was it incompetent to put New Vegas' development team against a tight clock like that, it was reckless and fucking irresponsible in terms of worker health. And to top it all off, Bethesda famously tied pay bonuses to the game's Metacritic score of all things, and didn't give Obsidian a promised payout because the game didn't earn high enough numbers from reviewers. The concept of performance bonuses tied to Metacritic scores is ludicrous in its own right, across the industry and should never have been a thing, but for Bethesda to implement that bonus after giving the developer so much to do in such little time, well it's a bloody scandal and it should never be forgotten. Bethesda attempted to make money off modders way back in 2015 when it and Valve introduced paid mods. Bethesda jumped aboard the idea with the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, potentially upending a system of freely available community content that has existed since roughly 1802. It seemed especially rich coming from a company that releases such famously buggy games that modders have a field day fixing them, and it clearly didn't work out too well for anyone because Valve very promptly discarded the whole idea. The problem was that Valve thought it would be easy 
to monetize modding the way the game industry monetizes everything else. Admitting that trying to shoehorn paid mods into Skyrim and disrupting an established enthusiastic modding community was a misjudgment on their part. Valve admitted it didn't quite understand Skyrim's community as well as it understood its own. A suitable excuse for Valve. One that doesn't work for Bethesda, which happily went along with all of this and either didn't care about its own community or somehow didn't understand it either. However generous you want to be with it, it's clear the Elder Scrolls people fucked up things for the Elder Scrolls modders. The whole situation speaks volumes about the game industry at large and how it doesn't want to leave a scrap of content on the table that doesn't go unpaid for. Community created mods have been around as long as PC gaming has and that didn't stop either Valve or Bethesda from trying to carve out a piece of the pie that themselves. People love to call game customers entitled, but no entity acts more entitled in this industry than game publishers themselves, and Paid Mods is one of dozens of illustrations of the fact. The original implementation of paid mods had failed, but Bethesda had already smelled blood in the water by that point and it was only a matter of time before the concept would rear its ugly head once more. Cue a system that nobody really asked for, the Fallout 4 Creation Club. Essentially, the return of paid mods with a new name, the final form of the Creation Club was basically a microtransaction store with the microtransactions outsourced to modders. Unlike general mods, Bethesda pre-approved Creation Club submissions and sold them on, with the launch offerings being really fucking bland, mostly boring reskins. Like any good microtransaction system, the publisher slyly sidestepped straightforward purchases by having users buy credits with which to purchase the mods. Because of course. A number of launch offerings were just remade versions of existing mods such as the Hellfire Armor which could not only be downloaded for free elsewhere but looked notably better than the reappropriated versions Bethesda was flogging. Considering how utterly sceptical the community at large was regarding this creation club, the heat was on Bethesda to shut up critics and knock it out of the park at launch, providing compelling modifications that were worth an additional asking price and added significant content to Fallout 4. And instead, we got shitty reskins and inferior clones of existing mods, stuff you could get elsewhere, better and without a service charge. It was the laziest possible implementation of the idea, an idea that had an uphill struggle to justify itself in the first place. The best part was how Bethesda kept trying to tell everyone they weren't paid mods, even though they were mods that people paid for. They were insistent that Creation Club purchases were mini DLCs, even though they looked like mods, worked like mods, and fucking were mods. They're mods. They're paid mods. But Bethesda's argument was that they weren't paid mods, because that's not what Bethesda was calling them. To celebrate the launch of the Creation Club, Bethesda gave users 100 credits to spend on the paid mods that were mods you paid for. The problem is that pittance could only really get you a paint job for your armor or fucking pit boy skins. So really, all the freebie did was give away what a con job the credits were. Well played. <laughs> Bethesda is so good at breaking games that even when it fixes a game, it manages to break it worse. Such as that time they patched Skyrim so well that dragons started flying backwards. Yep. Quite notoriously, a first big fix to Skyrim fucked up the main focal point of the game, so that dragons swooped across the sky, anus first. While that was quite funny, the other breakages associated with this patch were far from amusing. All resistances stopped working, meaning no matter what a player's defensive bonuses, they were taking full damage at all times. Update 1.2 was one to be avoided because of how much it fucked player characters over in this regard. But of course, that wasn't the be all end all. This update also brought with it plenty of crashes and a general increase in the performance bugs as well, because this is Bethesda, one of the few studios not only capable of fixing a game to the point of unfixing it, but to do so to nobody's surprise. And that's the key issue here. Bugs are to be expected in many games from many developers, and yes, even patches can break shit. But Bethesda's breakages are downright routine, a part of every game they make, and so ubiquitous as to be an unfunny running joke among the community. The fact nobody was actually shocked that Bethesda could patch a game so badly it broke the most important aspects of said game should tell you all you need to know about the studio's technical failures. Now look, I love Skyrim, I adore Skyrim even, it's become very popular to hate on that game these days, but I adored it at the time and I can still happily play any one of the 800 re-releases today. But it is a bug riddled mess, which is not the end of the world, there are plenty of buggy games that are still incredibly lovable such as the original Red Dead Redemption. But I must say, I'm starting to seriously rethink my own previous 
critical acclaim for the free pass Bethesda seems to think it has today. Like they think they can get away with anything today because we've all come to see it as charming when they fuck up. These days, especially in a year where Red Dead Redemption 2, Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Spider-Man have all pushed the boat out with open world games on a technical, storytelling or content level, Bethesda is no longer the market leader it was and really needs to push the boat out if it wants to reclaim its place in the industry. So how has Bethesda moved away from backwards flying dragons and broken save files? What has Bethesda produced in answer to Rockstar, Insomniac, Ubisoft and more? I mean, let's not forget the millions of people crying, Witcher 3 is better than Skyrim, it's better than anything Bethesda's done. All of these open world games, games of such scale with far fewer bugs than what they've put out in the past, surely Bethesda has an answer. It has a killer game in the wings. It's coming out, it came out, it had something this year that would shut people up. What was it? What is it? What will it be? Oh yeah. That. This fucking thing. Here we are with Fallout 76 just weeks after Red Dead Redemption 2. Now don't get me wrong, I'm sure 76 has made Bethesda plenty of money. You can be incompetent and still succeed, there's a reason why failing upwards is a concept. But Fallout 76 is undoubtedly fucking terrible, total dog shit, and an exposure of just how old and clunky Bethesda's well-worn formula has become. Fallout 76 is a bad idea, executed badly, and when I say that, I don't mean to say Fallout multiplayer is bad inherently. Bethesda's vision for the form that multiplayer takes, however, is inherently fucking rotten. Rather than create an engaging, story-driven Fallout game, or at the very least a Fallout take on something like Destiny, Bethesda felt what the world needed was yet another half-baked open-world survival game, yet another copy of Rust. With NPCs eradicated and replaced with audio tapes or computers, with settlements missing and engaging quests stripped out, Bethesda managed the slam dunk of making a Fallout game without the Fallout in it. Which might not have been a problem if they replaced it with anything good, instead they just took shit away. Now like with Skyrim, I enjoyed Fallout 4 and I've admittedly given Bethesda a huge pass in the past because I liked their storytelling and quest progression. But that's the rub, isn't it? By taking those out, Bethesda has effectively burned its one get out of jail free card, exposing the archaic, clunky, glitch-ridden skeleton that barely holds together the company's titles. Fallout 76 has an always online requirement, but like any AAA game with an always online requirement, that only applies to the users never the publishers. They don't feel a need to keep their servers stable, and Bethesda sure as shit hasn't. The game is prone to disconnects that freeze the game for a considerable amount of time, and because it doesn't autosave enough, you can lose a fair chunk of progress because of it. The usual bugs and performance issues are abundant, and as for VATS, oh boy. It just doesn't work. Because the game's online, VATS doesn't let you stop the action to target enemies anymore, which was a necessity in the past due to Bethesda's first-person combat being janky. Instead, it's just an auto-target system that can't cope with how skittish the enemies are, so your chance to hit cannon will often drop from 95% to 0% in less than a second and back up again, up and down like the world's shittest yo-yo. It's like that one section with a gun from the recent Cyanide Call of Cthulhu game but worse. And considering that game's an investigative RPG that just threw in an auto-targeting gun section for the sake of it, the fact real-time VAT is worse than that is remarkable. In its desperate bid to jump aboard the live services bandwagon, Bethesda decided to eliminate every advantage it's ever had. Because when you have unique and interesting elements inherent to your series, it's always a good idea to take those out and do what everyone else is doing, but shitter. Cool move, Bethesda. Cool move. Fallout 76 is kind of like Dynasty Warriors 9, which released earlier this year, in that it came out and was so crap that it caused me, a fan, to retrospectively look back at my previous love of the games and see all the flaws, exposed as they were by the new shitness. And here's something I need to explain to people because they don't quite get it. Some people out there get very, very angry, but they don't understand what context is. Change on its own is neither good nor bad for the most part. It's only good or bad if it's a good or bad change. Some people have looked at my loving of other changes Bethesda's made to games in the past. You know, like the change from traditional Fallout to Fallout 3. And they're like, well he liked the change, he defended the change that time, but he doesn't like the change this time. What a hypocrite! No, no, they're different games. 
eight years or so apart and the changes are completely different. And I can think the changes in one thing are good and the changes in another thing are shit. And it all comes down to whether the changes are good or shit. The f changes that were made in Fallout 3, I liked. The changes made in Fallout 76, I didn't. And I think, very much like Dynasty Warriors 9 and what they did there, what they did to this game, exposed all of the flaws and made all of the problems with the Bethesda game all the more evident. And I think, hopefully, I've explained that to people who, again, divorce context from situations, but who knows? All I know for sure is that everybody in the world, at all times, needs to thank God for me, because I am 100% objectively correct, and that's not me saying that. That's science.